This video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you've ever been lucky enough to have some fancy, expensive, flaky sea salt, you might have noticed a curious crystal shape in the mix. It's a hollow pyramid. This brand of sea salt from England is renowned for its particularly huge hollow pyramids. It looks like they made them in a mold, but they didn't. That crystal grew that way naturally. Table salt isn't the only mineral that does this. Under the right conditions, tons of rocks will crystallize that way. Scientists call it a hopper crystal. A hopper is a big box in a factory that tapers down to a narrow point underneath. It's used for funneling stuff into something else. That's a hopper. The crystal looks like a hopper, so they call it a hopper crystal. A lot of people, myself included, consider this a highly desirable shape for a finishing salt. That is, a salt that you put on right at the end. If the salt is going to be dissolved in the food, then that's a waste of a good crystal. Talking about a salt that you put in right at the end so that it will be intact on the top as you start to eat. Because the crystal is big, the saltiness is concentrated rather than being dispersed evenly across the food. This results in a heterogeneous eating experience. Different areas of the food taste different and combine in interesting ways in your mouth as you chew. And because those pyramidal crystals are hollow, they crunch as you bite through them. But as salt goes, salt products that have this shape in them tend to be very expensive because the traditional processes that give you this crystal shape are not quick. There may be less traditional ways of growing them a little bit faster, but all of my experiments at home have failed, and I've tried a million things. This is actually an area of active proprietary research by snack food companies. Hollow salt crystals have more surface relative to their total total mass, so they dissolve faster in your mouth and therefore they taste saltier. If snack makers can grow tiny hollow salt crystals, they can give us products that taste as salty as those covered in solid crystals but with less salt, and then they can sell us a bag that says, same great taste, now with less sodium. Those companies are not going to share their research with me. But this guy will share his research with us. My name is uh, Pietro Fontana. I'm a chemical engineer and uh, retired since uh, 10 years. Uh, my hobby are crystals and crystal growth. Dr. Fontana has published some awesome work on salt hopper crystals in recent years, and he's going to explain to us why they happen. Quick note, Dr. Fontana is Swiss. He's not super confident in his English, so when he and I spoke, he talked a lot of the time from prepared remarks that he had scripted in advance. I think that's totally fine. That's just why it sounds the way that it does. He also made a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to show you those slides as we go. The common salt uh, has a chemical formula of NaCl. It is composed of positively charged sodium and negatively charged chloride ions. Okay, so when you dissolve salt in water, those ions, those individual electrically charged sodium and chloride atoms, when they dissolve in water, you split them apart. Once fully dissolved, there are no sodium chloride molecules swimming around in here anymore. The water has broken the ionic bonds between the sodium and the chloride. Each individual atom is now surrounded by water. Technically, there is no salt in this pot anymore. It's a new substance commonly called brine. But as you evaporate the water out, you eventually reach a point where there just simply isn't enough water left to wrap around each of those atomic components of salt and keep them separate from each other. You end up having sodium and chloride ions that are able to bump up together again and start bonding into salt. You can already see it happening on the surface there. Solid salt rising up out of solution and floating on top. You see here in the model of the salt structure with uh, violet sodium and green chloride ions. They are arranged in a three-dimensional periodical array where a sodium ion is surrounded by six chloride ions, and the chloride ions is surrounded by six sodium ions. The smallest possible unit with the sodium chloride structure is a cube. A cube. These attractive forces cause those ions to bunch up and squish in together, and their natural tendency will be to bunch up in as compact a form as possible, and the resulting shape is going to be a cube. You might also get some other very simple geometric shapes depending exactly on how the first few ions actually start to come together, but the most common shape is going to be a cube. Normally a crystal grows layer by layer. 
And that's what Dr. Fontana is showing us on this slide here. As more ions come out of the solution and link up with the others, they basically replicate that cubic shape over and over again. That's the periodical array that Dr. Fontana was talking about. The period is the cubic shape. The array is that cubic shape kind of self-replicating over and over and over again into a highly ordered structure that they call a crystal. As a consequence, salt crystals remain the shape of cubes from micrometer to centimeter sizes. But that's with all things being equal, when the attractions between these ions are allowed to do what they want to do without other things getting in the way. In the real world, there are other factors at play, impurities in the water getting in between all the stuff, convection currents pushing things around, tiny variations in temperature that result in one area of the brine being more concentrated than another. All these factors and more result in tons of different shapes of crystals. In this spoonful of brine that I let evaporate in my kitchen, I've got some hoppers, I got some cubes, I got some bars, lots of different shapes going. Check this out. When I slowly simmered all the water out out of this brine, I got salt crystals growing up in these spindly tendrils, some of them like a centimeter long. This is apparently just how salt molecules link up when being pushed around by the particular soup of forces at play in a simmering pot. I don't claim to understand it, but there it is. In the case of hopper crystals, these hollow pyramids, that particular shape happens when the normal cubic growth of salt is interrupted by a few factors, one being speed. This block by block, layer by layer cubic growth. This happens when conditions in the brine are such that the crystal grows slowly. When, however, the crystallization rate is so that the growing layer is not completed before new ions arrive, hollow forms are developed. This happens when the solution is really super saturated, way more sodium and chloride ions in there than the available water can keep apart. Ions show up and start linking up on the edge of the crystal face before that new layer is even completed in the middle. This is known as skeletal growth, and the result is a hollow area in the center. It grows at the basis, and during the growth, the summit, uh, looks down to the brine. And once that happens, the salt crystal is basically a boat floating on the surface. Its buoyancy and the surface tension of the water keep its open face stuck to the surface of the water. Just like the surface of a boat, it's dry on the inside, so there's no way for new ions to get inside and start filling up the inside of the hopper. New ions just keep linking up along the edges at the surface, and the pyramid grows bigger and bigger and points down deeper and deeper into the brine. I can actually show you this happening. This is some brine that I have super saturated by boiling. Hot water can hold way more salt in solution than cool water can. I lay a film of that brine on a glass surface. It rapidly starts to cool down. It can't hold all of that salt in solution anymore, so crystals start forming really fast. What I'm showing you under the microscope camera happened over the course of just a few minutes. Look at those hoppers form. By growing the weight increases, when the gravity force is higher than the force of the surface tension and the force of buoyancy, the pyramid sinks to the bottom. Why does it fall? Well, for the same reason that a bug can walk on water, but I can't. Eventually, you just get too heavy for the surface tension of water to be strong enough to hold you aloft. These crystals just keep growing, they get bigger and bigger, they get so big and heavy that their buoyancy and the surface tension of the water is not strong enough to hold them at the top, so they sink down to the bottom, that's called sedimentation, and once they're down there, you will get no further hopper growth. That's why in the traditional fleur de sel process, they skim the crystals off the surface right before they fall. It is extremely labor-intensive. If the crystals fall, the hollow pyramids might start to fill in in, which I think is what happened to me in this particular experiment that I did in the oven. You can see that I've got a few little hollow crystals left there, but most of these have grown into big solid blocks. You gotta wonder then what would happen if you grew hopper crystals in a place where they could not fall a place where there is virtually no gravity to pull them down into the brine. This is exactly what Dr. Fontana and the American astronaut Don Pettit wanted to find out. 
So, while Dr. Pettit was on the International Space Station, he took out a little loop of wire and he dipped it into one of the packets of salt water they used to season their food up there. I guess a salt shaker would be pretty messy in microgravity. And the uh, sodium chloride solution that we have in the galley is close to a saturated solution. So once we draw one of these films, it doesn't take much evaporation before the crystals start to grow. Because the gravitational forces are basically symmetrical up there, you don't get pyramids. You get hopper cubes. Six different hoppers, one on each side of the cube, all growing out in six different directions. Six different hollows on each side of the cube. And because it will never sink, the sky's the limit on size. If you have a lot of uh, material available and a lot of space, uh, it is uh, no reason why it is not possible to make uh, huge uh, salt crystals in space. Of course, to do that, you'd have to keep isolating the crystals, pull out a good one, and get it growing by itself in a fresh film of brine. This is true on Earth as well. If you let multiple crystals keep growing near each other, they may eventually agglomerate or cake together. And that's what happened in my spoon experiment. The crystals bond together in what's called a raft, and thus their growth is restricted. In every attempt that I made to grow big hopper crystals here at home, agglomeration was the main limiting factor. I posted this on my Instagram. I tried tons of different supersaturation levels, lots of different evaporation temperatures and humidities. My crystals always caked together before the hoppers could grow to any decent size. What happened here, though? Well, in that one, I boiled my salt in a one-to-one -one mixture of water and ethanol. Booze. Salt doesn't dissolve in alcohol, so I figured that maybe it would act as like a buffer. It would get in between the growing crystals and keep them from agglomerating together before they had a chance to grow to a substantial size. And I did end up getting very clean, distinct crystals. This is the biggest one that I got, but as you can see, it's not a hopper crystal. It seems to have like the internal structure of a hopper crystal, but the hollows are filled in. Dr. Fontana applauded my industry here, but he couldn't really explain what was going on with the alcohol, and he didn't really have any tips for me about how I could grow big hopper crystals myself at home. As far as I can tell, nobody, at least on the internet, has cracked this particular code. There's lots of guides online for how to make your own flaky salt at home, but if you look at those, they've got these rafts forming at the top of their brine, and the crystals are agglomerating long before you get big, distinct hopper crystals. The doc pointed out to me that all the traditional processes are very particular. They have to be done in big pools so the crystals have lots of space. They require just the right rate of evaporation, just the right right temperature, just the right humidity, basically the conditions you get on the Mediterranean coast where they make fleur de sel. But even fleur de sel usually doesn't have very big hopper crystals. I've seen some big ones that were made on Cyprus, but the biggest ones I've ever seen are malt and sea salt, this very expensive salt made on the southeast coast of England. I've emailed the Malden company several times, and apparently they are not interested in sharing their centuries-long trade secrets with me. Totally understand that. There is this promotional video that they made that I've linked in the description. Judging on what I can see in there, I'm guessing that maybe it's their agitation of the brine that keeps the crystals from agglomerating before they can grow to a decent size, but that is just a guess. If anyone has any ideas on how to easily make hopper crystals at home, drop them in the comments. But if you need to easily make a website at home, I can tell you how to do that right now. You just use Squarespace. In this last crazy year or two, a lot of people have been starting their own businesses. They're selling their time, their expertise, their content, even their physical products online. Squarespace gives you all the tools you need to do that, and I mean all of them. The tools to build a website and take people's money there, even integrate with the other tools you use. Our platform is the ideal place for them to be able to invest in bulk as our Etsy integrations for product and reviews make it easy for you to have your own website and continue to manage your Etsy store efficiently. And it's not just Etsy. A Squarespace site will integrate flawlessly with Open Table for taking reservations, nearly anything you can think of. Squarespace is everything you need to sell anything. And they'll sell you a site for 10% off if you use my code Ragusia at checkout. You can start building a site for free, but when you're ready to pay to publish, use my code. Thank you, Squarespace. And thank you, Salt. Square or pyramidal, you've gotta be my favorite inorganic substance in this universe.